And joining us now on the line from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University professor Nicholas Christakis. He is the co-author of Connected, the Surprising Power of Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives. Professor Christakis, it's good of you to take some time for us. How are you tonight? Thank you for having me. I want to start by just finding out about you. Where did you develop this interest in studying social networks from? Oh, my goodness. Um, in the 1990s, well, I'm, I'm both a physician and a social scientist. And in the 1990s, I was uh, practicing hospice medicine, which I still do. I was taking care of people who are dying. Um, at the time, I was at the University of Chicago. And um, in my lab, I was researching the widower effect, which is the fact that um, when someone dies, their spouse has an increased risk of death. It's a kind of dying of a broken heart phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And um, one day, I was taking care of an, uh, an old woman who was dying. And her, her daughter was uh, the principal caregiver. And the daughter was exhausted from caring from her mother. And, um, and, the husband's, and the daughter's husband, he also had become sick from concern for his wife. And as I was driving home that particular day from caring for this woman, I get a call from the husband's best friend um, who was calling me out of concern for his friend. And so it suddenly dawned on me that this, this, this thing I had been interested in, this widower effect, applied not just to husbands and wives, but also to other pairs of individuals, for instance, um, uh, mothers and daughters, and also that it applied not just to pairs, but that it applied to larger groups of people. So, so for instance, it didn't just spread from one person to another, my risk of death increasing, let's say, the risk of death of someone else or making, of my spouse or making them ill, but that it could ripple and cascade through larger groups of people. Now, just to make sure we're all speaking the same language, because my suspicion is if you say to our viewers, social networks, they're going to say Facebook. That's not what you mean, that, right? No, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, that's right. I, it's not what I mean. What's amazing to me is that these social networks that we humans create, we've been creating them for hundreds of thousands of years. In fact, since we emerged from the African savanna, and we, we spend our lives embedded in these networks of incredible complexity, where we're connected to strangers via sequences of interactions between non-strangers. So I'm connected to my friends and family and coworkers and neighbors, and those people are connected to their friends and families and coworkers and neighbors and so forth, such that I can come to be connected to somebody that I don't know, but somebody who, when he or she feels or acts or, or thinks a certain thing, those uh, thoughts and feelings and actions can ripple through the network and affect me, quite apart from the very modern um, instantiation of, of social networks, these kind of modern online networks that we all talk about nowadays. Now, just before we try to understand and explore what you actually found, I want to get the, the sort of baseline for this, because you used the widely regarded Framingham Heart Study, which has tracked people over, I guess, about 60 years to analyze the social networks. And I just want to start by asking, why did you use the Framingham Study for starters? Well. First of all, I should say that my co co colleague, James, colleague and friend, actually, James Fowler, with whom I've been doing this work for the past 10 years, um, uh, analyze and study a variety of data sets and, um, and use a variety of methods. Uh, some of our methods are actually kind of interesting. We are actually doing some experiments where we explore how social networks work by experimentally intervening in them. Uh, but most of our work initially was done, as you say, with this very well-known Framingham Heart Study. And um, at the time, when James and I started this work seven or so years ago now, 10 years ago, we um, had wanted to study a large sample of people uh, where we took the people and asked them who their friends and family and colleagues were and so forth, and then approached those individuals and asked them to participate in our study and asked them in turn for their friends and colleagues, and then approached those individuals and asked them to participate in our study, and then I'll follow all these people for you know, years. And uh, this was going to cost millions of dollars. And we approached the National Institutes of Health uh, for this funding. And the National Institute on Aging said that they would be willing to give us a pilot funds if, uh, to study a smaller project to get it off the ground uh, if we could think of an easier, quicker way to do this. And around this time, I had been exploring with the Framingham Heart Study the idea of perhaps using some of their participants to start this whole project. And I had gone over there one day, uh, and I really wanted to understand how they tracked their participants. Because beginning in 1948, they impaneled about two-thirds of all the adults in the city in their study. And those people have been coming back every two years since then to be studied. And only 10 people out of over 5,000 have been lost to follow-up. And in 1971, they impaneled another 5,000 people, the children of those original cohort 
and their uh, spouses. And again, only 10 of those have been lost to follow up in the intervening 30 or so years. So I really wanna, wanted to understand how they track all these people. And, and I went to meet uh, with a person who was responsible for the tracking operations. And I said, well, how do you do this? And she showed me this little piece of paper that they had where they asked everybody, where do you live? Who are your friends? Uh, who is your spouse? Who are your siblings? Uh, where do you work? And so forth. And it suddenly dawned on me that by dumb luck, a lot of those coworkers and friends and siblings and spouses would also be participants in the Framingham Heart Study. And so if we could computerize those paper records, which had never been previously used for research, we could reconstruct these social networks for decades. And in fact, that's what we did. We spent half a million dollars and quite a number of years in the chart room using these paper records. And we were able to reconstruct over 50,000 social ties for these 5,000 people embedded in this social network. Hmm. And we were able to see how those ties changed across time as people got married or divorced, as their friendships changed, as people were born or died, as they changed employers. And we were able also to track all these people and know all kinds of things about them every four years or so, whether they were happy or sad or what their weight was or whether they had heart disease and so forth. And so we built this, to be honest, rather special data set. And this allowed us to ask all kinds of new questions we hadn't previously been able to study. Let me pick up on one of those themes that you just mentioned and talk about the connection among people on that theme. Obesity. What did you find about yes. the nature of that relationship? Well, around the time we had begun this study, it had become very fashionable, actually it still is, to speak of the obesity epidemic. And it's quite clear that obesity is epidemic in one sense of the word, meaning that there's more of it than there used to be. But James and I wondered whether it was epidemic in another sense of the word, meaning that there was something contagious going on. It was spreading from person to person. And to the extent that people are embedded in these social networks, and to the extent that obesity is a product of voluntary choices and actions, and to the extent that people are influenced by the choices and actions of those around them, it struck us as quite likely that obesity literally could be socially contagious, could spread from person to person. And so this was the first thing that we tackled to see whether we could document a kind of social contagion um, for obesity. And, and when we did this, when we mapped the network and we used a variety of statistical techniques to kind of sort out how it worked, we found that as someone's friends gained weight, um, they gained weight. And in fact, as they gained weight, they then passed it on to still other people further on in the network. And I should emphasize that when you look at for these kinds of things within social networks or when you do these kinds of studies, you have to be very careful to, to disentangle different kinds of effects. So for example, you have to be able to tell the difference between birds of a feather flocking together. Maybe thin people hang out with thin people and overweight people hang out with overweight people. So we shouldn't be surprised to find overweight people connected to other overweight people. Or maybe people who lose weight cause others to lose weight or people who gain weight influence others to gain weight. That would, we would call that uh, sort of induction. Or maybe all these people are share an exposure to something in the environment, like fast food, for example, or gym, gyms. And, that, and those exposures cause them to gain or lose weight. So it's not that I'm connected to you. I don't, so, so it's not that I, let's see, it's not that I choose to befriend you because you and I have the same body size, nor that um, my weight gain causes your weight gain, but rather that you and I share an exposure to something that makes us both gain or lose weight at the same time. All of those things are happening. And so the challenge is to kind of figure out a way to disentangle those things, which is what we did. And we were able to show that as one person, if your best friend, for instance, becomes obese, it, uh, in any given time interval, it can double uh, or triple your risk of becoming obese in the same time interval. Do you think, I mean, I know you've, you've tracked it and you've done the, the hard data on this, but do you think that is still a hard sell to many people who will feel, okay, I understand <laughs> that I'm connected to other people, but come on, there's no way that just because I'm perhaps uh, 25 pounds overweight, that my friend will be, and her friend will be, and his friend will be. It ain't just necessarily so. Is that a hard sell? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. We're accustomed to accepting the fact that we're influenced by other people in all sorts of domains of our life. That, um, you know, the clothes we choose, or the music we listen to, uh, or that germs, for instance, can spread through networks, or that money can spread through networks. We're used to thinking about those kinds of things as spreading through networks. But, but what we have been able to show, James and I, is that certain other kinds of phenomena that um, are seemingly very deeply personal and very deeply individualistic, like your emotional state or your, um, your body size, that these kinds of things also uh, have a kind of collective existence 
and can spread through networks. Uh, I understand. Let me try another example with you. And, and for example, I can completely understand how uh, on um, the 27th of October 2004, there was a general happiness in New England because your baseball team won a World Series for the first time in 86 years. And so happiness spread throughout. I was here when the curse, I was here when the curse was reversed. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, we, I understand how happiness gets spread through a social network in that way. They won a World Series. But more generally oh, but speaking. Okay, but that would be an example of confounding. We all become happy at the same time because we share an exposure uh, to the Red Sox winning. That's not a spreading process of the kind we're interested in. We're interested in a different kind of thing, whereby my happiness, let's say, increases your, uh, ha my friend's happiness. And um, what we were able to find was that, uh, was just that, that in fact, that people's happiness is related to the happiness of their friends and their friends' friends and their friends' friends' friends. Now, these effects are not huge. We're not trying to say that, you know, if your friend's friend's friend becomes happy, you necessarily will suddenly become happy. We're just saying that these effects are discernible. And what's interesting is, if you think about this, most people are used to thinking about emotional contagion. Um, they're used to the recognition that their, their moods are affected by the moods of others. Um, and in fact, I, I was talking about this topic in New York City not long ago. And um, I said, you know, like when you're on a subway and, and someone smiles at you and you just instinctively smile back. And they looked at me and they said, well, we don't do that in New York City. I said, well, everywhere else in the world, that's normal. That's normal behavior everywhere else in the world. Someone smiles at you. So we're used to thinking about brief sort of person-to-person -person spreads of emotions. Uh, you go home at the end of the day. Um, you step through the door. Your spouse is depressed uh, or angry. And it, you immediately copy, let's say, that emotion. But what's less obvious is the extent to which emotions can spread not just between pairs of individuals, but also between larger, larger agglomerations of individuals, and not just over brief periods of time, but over more sustained periods of time. I suspect most of our viewers at some point or another have played that game, uh, what's it called, six degrees of separation or six degrees to Kevin yes. Bacon, that kind of thing, where you'll know somebody who'll know somebody who'll know somebody, and six degrees later, that person knows Kevin Bacon. You, you've got something similar with what you're calling three degrees of influence. I, I, is that somewhat similar, somewhat different? How would you characterize it? We see the six degrees of separation rule or observation about the world as being about connection. It's a, it's a statement about how from any one human being to any other on average on, on the planet, it takes about six handshakes from person to person to person and so forth before you can reconnect these two people on average. What we found is that even though that's how connected we are, our influence doesn't spread, not surprisingly, to everyone on the planet. And that when I do something, it affects my friends and family and coworkers and their friends and family and coworkers, and to, a, and to a lesser extent, their friends and families and coworkers, but then it decays and disappears. And we call this the three degrees of influence rule. And there are a number of reasons uh, why it might only spread three degrees. And one obvious one is just that our effects decay. I mean, uh, it's like the children's game of telephone. You know, the fidelity of the message declines as you get further and further away from the source. That's one of their possible reasons. Uh, through things such as Facebook or Second Life, which are, I don't have to tell you, extremely popular and people spend way too much time on them these days. Or I, I think, oh, go ahead. I think that I, I think that massively multiplayer online game World of Warcraft, if it were a country, would be the eleventh largest uh, nation on the earth. Actually, incredible, incredible. That many people are involved in that thing. Yeah, that's exactly huh. right. Well, all right. Through those things, people have become, you know, they're creating increasingly larger social networks all the time. How can this change the influence of our social network? Um, I actually, I don't think it does. Um, I don't think the discovery and the dissemination of online social networks fundamentally change the way we interact with each other um, and our fundamental human connections any more than... Um, than the printing press or the telephone did. Now, those are obviously huge, dramatic uh, uh, discoveries and uh, inventions. And I'm not saying that society didn't change as a result of those things. What I'm saying is, is that the number of best friends that people had 100 or 1,000 years ago is the same as it is today. And the extent to which I'm influenced by other human beings and I'm influenceable and influential upon other human beings is about the same as it was. Um, 
And I think the best way to sort of illustrate this claim, and, and actually we discuss this at length in the book, we talk about how, how these technologies are the same but different, that there are aspects of our interconnection and our influence that haven't changed, and there are aspects of our interaction influence which have, but that fundamentally things haven't changed as much as we might think. And I illustrate this by, or we illustrate this by talking a little bit about the size of military companies. And in the modern army, a uh, military company is about 120 people, 100 people or so. And in the Roman army, uh, 2,000 years ago, had the same, about 120 people. Well, now why is that? Uh, to communication technology has changed hugely in the 2,000 years. We have, you know, radar and walkie-talkies and uh, radio and telephone and internet and everything else. And yet the fundamental working group hasn't changed the size. And the reason is that the ability of human beings to interact and to coordinate their activities and to influence each other and know each other, uh, which is essential, for instance, in the working group of a military company, despite the technology which has facilitated communication, the thing that still limits us is our brain and our humanities. Name of the book is Connected, The Surprising Power of Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives. Nicholas Christakis, it's good of you to join us on the line from Harvard tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.